So I, I'm a little bit uh, verklempt after uh, that uh, last uh, discussion because Paul's basically given my talk now about, uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm teasing a bit, but uh, we've had a day, a day of uh, lots of lectures and a fair amount uh, dealing with N2 uh, disease or the things around N2 disease and you've all had to bear with my voice for the whole day. Uh, so I, I'm just going to start off with a few words about we, we happy few, we band of surgeons. Uh, for you today who have listened to me, uh, you are my colleague, be you never so vile. Uh, this day shall gentle your condition and surgeons in England who are now abed shall think of themselves accursed that they were not here and hold their scalpels cheap whilst speaks those who were here today. So, thank you. I have no financial relationships or potential conflicts of interest to report. Um, this is one of our icons from our institution, Charlie Mayo, one of two brothers who uh, formed the, uh, the, the beginnings of our institution, and I think his quote from 1926 uh, is still valid, that, and, and that's why we're here today talking about cancer. Uh, there are things that are more destructive, but none is more feared. And you all know this, but it's a very important piece of data, especially as we fight for resources to uh, study lung cancer. The annual death, deaths from lung cancer outstrip those of colorectal cancer, breast cancer, pancreas and prostate combined. And uh, it always boggles my mind when I think of this data, why we stand behind these other organs in, 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 with uh, cap in hand to try and get funding for our research. Um, it is clearly an important piece. One of the reasons I became a thoracic surgeon, it's the number one cancer to fight. And uh, so all of you who do this, you are uh, doing an important job. Celsus, back in 47 AD, said there are three ways to treat the patient with severe disease. Medicine, diet, and surgery. But only surgery is successful. <laughs> and again, I'm speaking to the converted here, uh, so it's easy to say that. And, uh, with all due respect to our radiotherapist in the crowd. We're going to talk about uh, locally advanced disease, the N2 disease, uh, and the treatment options. Surgery alone has poor results. Chemotherapy alone has poor results. Radiotherapy alone has poor results, which argues, obviously, for a multidisciplinary approach. Again, we're repeating some things that I spoke about earlier and that others have touched on in various ways. Uh, there are the incidental nodal METs found on final surgical pathology that we are unaware of. There are the nodal METs recognized intraoperatively. There are mediastinal nodal METs documented preoperatively, either by mediastinoscopy or other modalities of invasive mediastinal staging. And then there are the bulky multistation and clearly unresectable or at least at, in this time, uh, unresectable N2 disease. We're going to focus on the third group here, those that are documented preoperatively. And, and what we've done at, at our institution and many institutions is, is because of a diligent uh, preoperative staging, we find these patients and we've been, uh, we've been putting them into uh, a, uh, an induction therapy protocol uh, with a strategy to bringing them to surgery. And you can see the difference of the different uh, single station versus multiple station, micro microscopic versus clinical, and the different survivals of these. So they're clearly different types of N2 disease. Again, this is the, the, the survival curves of those different N2 disease. Uh, and then the impact of induction chemotherapy. So I'm not here to give you um, the argument for neoadjuvant therapy, but I will sort of give you the reasons, some of the reasons why we do it. There, these are the survival curves back in the JCO published paper in 2000. Again, uh, clearly when you have response to the induction therapy, your, your result is better. 
Uh, the rationale for induction therapy is a lower likelihood of resistant clones, a lower kinetic resistance, increased likelihood of efficient drug delivery to the tumor because it has better blood supply prior to our surgery. Earlier, in, earlier um, introduction of chemotherapy increases the potential for significant tumor response. Early exposure of micrometastasis to systemic therapy increases potentially the cure, uh, even though there are micrometastases. Patient compliance prior to surgery is likely going to be better than with adjuvant therapy, and it allows us to assess the response of the tumor so that if we want to give adjuvant therapy, we may be a little bit better informed. Again, the randomized trials from way back when, as Gilbert Massar in his presentation this morning showed, you know, a lot of the data comes from many decades ago. This is the Roth trial. Again, uh, preoperative uh, chemotherapy and surgery, a better median survival of 64 months versus surgery alone. The Roselle trial, again, 22 versus 10 months in median survival. And then we have the SWOG trial from, uh, again, way back when, looking at uh, uh, surgery uh, versus uh, this, and showing that surgery improves survival. The um, N2 patients, so with induction chemotherapy, 202 were operated on 194 exclusive chemo radiation. Uh, survival without recurrence increased after surgery, and there was increased global survival after lobectomy, which is sort of what we were talking just about in that last discussion. Uh, Progression-free survival was better in the bimodality arm. Uh, overall survival uh, tended towards improved survival. Then you add radiation to this. Uh, again, the trimodality therapy uh, was uh, better than the chemoradiation arm. <clears throat> when you have the overall survival, this is the issue of pneumonectomy. Uh, the pneumonectomy ones give you a overlapping uh, survival curves. When you pull them out and do lobectomy alone, you show that, uh, that there was improvement in the trimodality arm, including surgery. <clears throat> and then uh, this is the pneumonectomy one where the, clearly surgery was, had a poorer survival. Uh, we're all aware of this, and that's why we sort of, as, as was said in the last discussion, try and do more parenchymal sparing operations after uh, induction therapy. <clears throat> what, and again, not to belabor all of these same pieces of data, um, what we've chosen to do and what we've done over the, over the last number of years at Mayo Clinic is to uh, uh, significantly search for uh, mediastinal metastatic disease. If found and the patient is a candidate, they will go for neoadjuvant chemo and radiation therapy followed by surgery. And again, these are the, a lot of those studies that we've seen earlier today, and I'm not going to belabor that. Uh, again, the lobectomy subgroup did better than the chemo radiation group. The conclusions were that N0 status at surgery predicts significantly better five-year survival, so if they've had good response. Uh, trimodality therapy uh, is not optimal if a pneumonectomy is required. Lobectomy after induction chemoradiation therapy is feasible in fit patients, and control of both local failure and systemic relapse remains the major challenge. So it's, it's within those boundaries that we choose to go ahead and operate on these patients after, in, after induction therapy. So, about half of the theory is that we downstage the tumor with induction therapy. That happens in about half of the patients. <clears throat> that increased completion of planned therapy versus adjuvant is true. There's an increased resection rate. That's unknown. Uh, there's increased morbidity and mortality. That, again, it's plus or minus. And then there's decreased micrometastases with induction therapy. That is unknown as well. And increased survival. I think that we tend to believe that as surgeons, uh, but we still have this controversy in those debates that get heated at our multidisciplinary conference. So what we do, uh, I try and time it so that we have our patients returning at about four weeks from their last radiation dose. 
One of the things I tell my patients who are going into uh, an induction treatment plan is to keep track of your schedule and let me know when the last radiation dose is going to be scheduled so that I can see them back at about four weeks <coughs> after their last radiation dose. I think that gives me a chance to plan their surgery and get them to the operating room before six weeks. I think the earlier we can get them to the operating room, the easier and technically your operation is. I restage with a PET CT and MRI of the brain and either EBUS or mediastinoscopy. Uh, and we redo the pulmonary function tests with a specific focus on uh, the diffusing capacity. In terms of the surgical considerations, I think perioperative fluid management needs to be <coughs> meticulous. Uh, these are patients who seemingly are more susceptible to reperfusion injury. <clears throat> and there may be pre-existing post-induction pulmonary third spacing that has occurred with the development of pulmonary hypertension and uh, chemotherapy-induced, uh, some to some degree, transient renal tubular dysfunction. So it, it behooves us to be very, very uh, strict with their fluid management around the time of the operation. I tend to encourage my anesthesiologists to use phenylephrine rather than crystalloid boluses. Uh, they know my uh, predilection for that, and so as time goes on in my practice, I don't have to repeat myself as much with them, but I still do. Uh, and the liberal use of postoperative diuretics. I think this is a very important piece for regular lung surgery, uh, but it, all of these principles are even more important when we're dealing with a patient who's undergone preoperative chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Perivascular fibrosis. The radiation does cause a change in the, in the local anatomy. There is fibrosis of both the hilar and mediastinal structures, and that increases with time. Hence, my interest in bringing them to the operating room early after radiation therapy, or at least earlier than many, uh, to try and minimize that. We give them time after radiation therapy not for the, to heal not for it to heal more, but, uh, not for it to uh, treat more, but for it to heal and give the chance for the patient to bounce back from their chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Most patients who are candidates for surgery will do so within four weeks. I have the same uh, philosophy for our uh, esophagectomy patients who uh, undergo neoadjuvant therapy as well, bringing them back at four weeks after their last radiation dose to be assessed for uh, resection. <clears throat> Again, on the topic of perivascular fibrosis, there is an obliteration of the adventitial plane around the pulmonary artery branches, and this is what makes it difficult. Uh, again, this is, a, this is a factor that increases with time, which makes so-called salvage surgery a much more difficult issue. Um, again, salvage surgery, uh, I, I was asked to write an article about this a while back, and salvage surgery, it's a little bit, in football, in, in, in American football, we have, you have four chances to make 10 yards and move along. Uh, fourth down is often a time when you give the ball up because you're not likely to make it, but some people risk fourth down. It's like, that's how I think of salvage surgery. Salvage surgery at eight weeks is different than salvage surgery at a year or 18 months. So it's fourth down in inches, versus fourth down and 20 yards. It's a different thing. <clears throat> and because of all these issues of fibrosis, I think it's often recommended to obtain central PA control early. If you don't get it early, uh, you should at least get it midway through when, you, when it's obvious that you will probably need it. The bronchial stump. There is radiation vasculitis, and that causes diminished bronchial blood flow and leads to poor stump healing. That's why we have increase, an increased rate of bronchopleural fistulas in patients who've had radiation first than those who have not had radiation. And there's multiple options. The serratus anterior muscle is one of the muscles we use uh, a fair amount of at, at Mayo Clinic. The intercostal muscle is also usable, but you have to think about that ahead of time. And, uh, it, Deciding midway through a case, especially a thoracotomy case where you've already put the, the retractor in and banged up the muscle, 
is not the time to think of using the intercostal muscle. You need to, you need to harvest it early, and you need to har harvest it in a, in a very meticulous way to preserve the blood flow so that it's not just a, a string of fibrous tissue in two weeks' time. Uh, pericardial fat pad or parietal pleura can also be used to cover the, the, the bronchial stump or the, um, yeah, or the bronchial stump and, uh, and is a useful piece. Uh, I don't think we've answered the question of whether this coverage acts as uh, increased blood flow versus a physical barrier. Uh, uh, and uh, Michael Mueller tried to do that a number of years ago with a study in Vienna, uh, but I, I'm not sure that that actually answered the full question. It may have caused more questions than answers. In terms of pneumonectomy, it's got a poor prognosis. It's to be avoided if possible. And to avoid it, uh, you're clearly encouraged to use bronchoplastic or parenchymal sparing techniques. Uh, again, after radiation, bronchoplastic techniques can be difficult or can be um, risky, but probably less risky than a pneumonectomy. So in terms of my take home messages from, for surgery after neoadjuvant therapy, patient selection is very important. Uh, this speaks to your judgment, and every surgeon in this room, you're all surgeons, that's probably your highest level skill, higher than a steady hand, a good judgment on choosing your patients appropriately and with, with good evidence-based thought is always important. Never be uh, insulted when you're up at the podium and someone questions you by saying you have a highly selected cohort. That's what you do, you're a surgeon. Pulmonary toxicity is, is real, it can happen, it's somewhat idiosyncratic, uh, but certain ke chemotherapy medications do cause uh, known uh, reactions to oxygen. Preventative measures can be to use low FiO2 as much as possible. Oxygen is a drug, it has a, it has a therapeutic range, and it's especially important when you have younger anesthesia people, uh, trainees in there, who believe in oxygen as mother's milk and they just turn it all the way up. Uh, it, it's, it's a real drug and it has a therapeutic range. So keeping, them, uh, keeping your FiO2 during the operation as low as is necessary, uh, uh, is, is, as low as is tolerated is, is really important. And I, I'm okay with the liberal use of steroids. Uh, renal toxicity of chemotherapy, it's important to keep that in mind. Some of the technical challenges as we've talked about um, it's important that if you, if, if you look at some of the studies uh, that are fairly difficult to generalize but real in highly, uh, high volume centers, there really is no significant increase in intraoperative complications. Uh, Postoperative morbidity and mortality can be slightly increased, uh, but it's not statistically significant. So meticulous care uh, can lead you to similar results as patients who have not received neoadjuvant therapy. Bronchial stump coverage is important, and any time you've had a patient who's been radiated, you need to cover it with something. I think it, 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 you owe it to the stump to do that. Wait four to six weeks for adequate recovery after neoadjuvant therapy prior to surgery, but don't wait too long. There are many brave, I'll leave you with this quote, there are many brave surgeons, but most often the bravest person in the operating room is the patient. Uh, you have to make sure that what you're doing has good judgment, uh, that you're ready for those cases. And if, if you're younger, and some of the people in the crowd are, are younger, bring your senior, senior person along with you. Have that support. Be in a place where you're going to have that support. We choose to go to the moon or to do N2 disease in this decade, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And we leave you with Bob Ginsburg's quote. Thank you.